Front Desk, Chapter 31 At school, Jason continued making fun of my clothes. Even the sixth graders were in on it now. At first, I managed to convince myself that it was kind of flattering that they were even talking about me. But then I heard what they said. In the bathroom, a couple of sixth grade girls were gossiping. Her pants! Oh my god, have you seen her pants? They asked each other while I sat in the stall. It's like she buys her clothes by the pound. My grandmother dresses better than her. I sat on the toilet waiting for them to leave, my heart clenching like a fist. Dear Mean Girls, you're right. I buy my clothes by the pound. My mom and I go over to the Goodwill and we buy secondhand clothes. Clothes you probably threw away. I'm probably wearing your socks right now. Let me tell you that it's like what it's like to buy secondhand clothes. First, my mom washes it a million times. She scrubs it with her hands and then puts it in the washer and then scrubs it again. Still, when I first put it on, I wiggle and squirm, thinking of all the girls who've been inside the pants before. I used to hope it was girls like you, girls who live in big houses, girls who go on vacation in the summer. I used to think that maybe if I was wearing the same pants, I kind of went on vacation too. And that used to make me happy. Now, do you know what I think? I think I'd rather go on vacation than be like you. Mia Tang. P.S. Floral cotton pants are way more comfy than jeans. It was so satisfying writing the letter that for a full second, I actually thought about putting it into my backpack and giving it to the girls at school, but I didn't. School dragged on. The popular girls continued mocking me. Mr. Yao called up twice a day to scream at us. The only thing that made me feel a tiny bit better was that somebody left $5 in the tip jar after their stay. One afternoon, while I was sitting at the front desk, a beat-up old Chevrolet slowed by the motel. It inched forward toward us, the driver craning his neck as he peered in. I squinted inside the car and saw a Chinese man. I figured he must be a friend of Aunt Ling's, looking for the blue baseball cap, so I immediately waved at him to come in. Mr. Yao wasn't here. The coast was clear. Uncle Zhu was a big man, about six foot two. Two hundred pounds of northern Chinese, he said, proudly in his thick harpen accent. My dad pointed at his compact car. And you've been sleeping in that thing? Uncle Zhu had, exclaimed, had explained that he hadn't had a place to sleep for a little while. It's been a hard couple of weeks, he said, stretching as he said the words. Well... Let's get you a proper shower and a meal, my dad said, leading him toward room three. At dinner, Uncle Zhu told us he had been working as a janitor in a hospice. What's a hospice? I asked. It's... He thought for a minute about how to put it. It's basically a waiting room. You mean like at the airport? I asked. The day I left China, Shen had pointed to the waiting room in the arrival section right before I got on the plane. I'll see you right there in a couple of years, okay? He had said. I nodded. Tears stung the back of my eyes. The time will flash by like, Woom, he said, when he looked down at the floor and whispered. And when you come back, you'll be all American. No, I won't, I insisted. Will too. Nothing's going to change, Shen. Yes, it will, he said. You're going to come back wearing all kinds of fancy clothes. Oh, Shen, if you only knew. I looked up from my floral pants to Uncle Zhu. So is that what it is? A waiting room for arrivals? I asked. He glanced at my parents as if to get their permission. They nodded at him. It's a waiting room for people who are about to pass away, he finally said. Oh. Ever so quietly, my mother picked up the last of the beef with her chopsticks and set it down onto Uncle Zhu's plate. Uncle Zhu set off for San Diego the next morning. When I heard San Diego, I dashed to the front office and jotted down another one of the addresses. Uncle Zhu promised he'd drive by and call me if he saw the Thunderbird. 
As my dad and I waved to Uncle Zhu, suddenly I had an idea. I turned to my dad. What if we hide Hank like the immigrants? I asked him. Then Mr. Yao would stop screaming at us. He would never know. My dad shook his head and said that it was way too risky. The immigrants only stayed for one night, whereas Hank lived here. We were bound to get caught. I decided to drop it. A week later, my parents received their paycheck from Mr. Yao. $140 was missing. True to his word, Mr. Yao was making us pay for Hank. $20 per day. My uncle got into a big fight. With, my parents got into a big fight about what to do. My mother said he should quit. We should quit, but my dad wouldn't hear of it. Quit, my dad said, and do what? You think it's any better out there? You heard the stories from all the immigrants. My mother re didn't respond, but instead went into the kitchen and pulled out stinky tofu paste from the back of the cupboard. Stinky tofu paste was this disgusting concoction you could buy at the Chinese supermarket, which she ate whenever she'd been through a lot. And even though I didn't like the smell of the tofu, I still liked it more than hearing my parents fighting. As my mom munched away on her paste, my dad and I sat outside by the curb, waiting for the smell to clear. The early evening wind sighed between us. I wanted to tell him it was going to be okay that I had a plan to save us. All I needed was $30, and I even had a plan for that too. Was $300, and I even had a plan for that too. So far, I had made $30 in tips. But I didn't end up telling him. I was worried if he knew about the $30, he might take it away, and then I wouldn't be able to save us. Chapter 32 in school the next day, Mrs. Douglas clapped her hands together and announced we were having a math challenge. No, no, we're not ready, we insisted. But Mrs. Douglas wouldn't hear any of it. She split us into teams of four. We were to work together to solve one extra tough math question, and the first team with the right answer was the winner. Jason, thankfully, was not on my team. But Bethany, Joanne, and Paula were, and they were three of the most popular girls in our year. I braced for more jokes about my pants. To my surprise, when they heard I was on their team, they cheered. Yes, we got the Chinese girl. I took a seat next to my new teammates and smiled. I gazed up at the board, pencil ready, determined not to let my team down. I couldn't believe my eyes when Mrs. Douglas finished writing the problem on the board. It was a problem about a motel. The daily rate for a room at a motel is $30 a day. A customer at a motel wants to rent the room for just two hours. How much does the motel charge the customer? I glanced at Jason, who looked similarly stoked. I clutched my pen tighter. No way was I letting him win this. $30, I said to my teammates immediately. Just because someone leaves early, you don't give him a discount. Bethany tossed her blonde hair over her shoulder and looked hesitantly at me. Are you sure? She asked. Shouldn't it be cheaper? I shook my head. Trust me, I wanted to say. I've been doing this a long time. It's $30, I repeated. I'm positive. My group went with my answer, raising their hands to, miss, to tell Mrs. Douglas. But as soon as we told Mrs. Douglas our answer, she shook her head and said it was wrong. That is not the correct answer, she said. Angry eyes turned to me. You said it was $30, my teammates yelled at me. I'm, I'm sorry, I muttered. You're Chinese. You're supposed to be good at math. She's not Chinese, Joanne said. Her eyes dropped to my pants. She's ugly knees. The words sliced into me. By the time we went back and started calculating 2 divided by 24 times $30, Jason's group already blurted out the correct answer, $2.50. We had lost the math challenge. Bravo, Mrs. Douglas said, handing Jason's team cherry lollipops as she clapped her hands again and asked us to return to our original seats. Jason sat next to me, sucking loudly on his lollipop, boasting his victory with every lick. 
Guess it's official, he said. I'm better than math than you at math. I wanted to remind him that I was there when his dad screamed at him for being terrible at math, or had he forgotten, but that would have been too Jason of me. As Jason sucked away on his lollipop, I looked around at all the other kids. Lupe and everyone else were chatting and laughing, even though they also lost, while Bethany, Joanne, and Paula continued glaring at me from across the room. I could feel their disappointment on my back, shoulders everywhere. I put my head down in my hands, wondering if I looked more like the other kids in my class. If I had blonde hair and blue eyes, then would it be okay that I sucked at math?